Hey guys, I am coming to you before this episode, which is a great episode by the way, so stay tuned for it. I'm coming to you before this episode because I just want to let you guys know that I am okay. I know that yesterday some news broke about my health and I wanted you guys here in the Heal Squad to know from me and my lips that uh, I'm grateful that I am uh, alive and well and healthy, and all of this is luckily behind me. Of course, I'll have to get scans forever to make sure, like anybody else, but um, it's been a wild 2023, to say the least, and I am so grateful to this show because, as I've said, the show saved my life in so many ways, and um, if it wasn't for the show, I don't know what would have happened to me. Um, I'm so grateful to my doctors my Dr. Aaron and my primary care who's been with me since the beginning with the brain tumor situation. He really saved my life by pushing everybody to move very, very quickly. And uh, Dr. Donahue for um, his expert work removing a few organs. <laughs> uh, it was wild. Um, and, you know, he's uh, he's done this a lot. He's a very successful doctor, so I'm so grateful for him. Obviously, my dad and Kevin for taking such good care of me and uh, Kevin and Kelsey for running the ship here. And I know that Kevin had a fill in for me for a while on the show. And so I'm grateful to all of you guys for always hanging in with us because uh, health stuff just has happened. And you guys have always been so wonderful to hang in with us and and stay on the journey with us, whether I'm here physically or not. Um, we keep the mission going because this, this show's for all of us. It's for me, it's for you. And, uh, I know it's been helping you guys as well. And so I'm really grateful and I'm hopeful that this message just gets out wider now. Um, part of the reason I wanted to share the story is because I do believe that we need to be paying so much more attention to our health. That's why I do this show every day. But these outside scans, I think, are going to be a really big deal for people who feel like they're being gaslit, who feel like they aren't getting answers, who feel like uh, they're not being believed. Um, I think that's going to be a really big thing. We'll talk about it on the show. Um, And I'm working diligently to try to get this covered for everybody because I know it's not an option for some, but I'm going to work on it, I promise you. Uh, The diabetes thing was a zinger last summer (laughs) in June for me. Getting diagnosed with that really knocked me off my feet because I had quit sugar. I'd done all the things to not have that happen, but I dealt with it and I had so many breakthroughs that I cannot wait to share with you guys that are going to just blow your minds. I didn't want to share it in real time as I was doing things because I thought that would be dangerous. And so um, I do have really huge breakthroughs for you guys on that. So anybody who's diabetic is going to love this. And so we are going to do an entire Diabetes Week on the show. Really excited to delve deep into that. Uh, I'm so excited to not have to hide my glucose monitors and (laughs) I'm shooting insulin in like (laughs) random places. And now I always like also with the Ozempic craze, I'm like, do people think I'm doing Ozempic? (laughs) I'm not. Um, Anyhow, um, so we'll do a whole Diabetes Week and we will do a whole series uh, dedicated to pancreas cancer because this is something that people don't have a lot of signs. Um, and that's why people go so quickly. And so I'm really blessed and really, really, really lucky to have found it when I did, because as I do the math and I look at how it was going to go, I really might not have met my baby. And, um, I'm just so grateful that that's not the case. And I'm grateful that she's going to get to meet me. And as I've been doing my Dr. Joe meditations, I see her coming out of the womb, going skin to skin with me. And she's going to know that I'm the healthiest mama in the world for her. And that we're going to go the distance. And I know that's exactly what's happening. And even though it appears like a lot of things happen to me health wise, I do think they're happening for me because I see the list of things that I've been working on for this last year with Dr. Joe's meditations, all just going away and I'm being healed. And so I, I really believe that the healing is coming before my little, my little blessing comes. So I love you all. And I thank you so much for being on the journey with us. I hope you'll invite your friends to be part of the heal squad. I think you'll see now more than ever how important it is for all of us to uh, to go on this journey. 
Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to Better Together. When you know better, you get better. That's our goal here every single day. It's what we do. We live to learn. We live to get better. And uh, and we like doing it with you. So thanks for being with us. Our quote of the day, healing is a matter of time, but it is sometimes also a matter of opportunity. That's from Hippocrates. That Lovely, Greek guy. Right? That Greek guy. <laughs> that one Greek guy. <laughs> that very important Greek guy. Uh, Heal Squad, what up? Welcome back. Today we are chatting with Dr. Zach Bush. You are in for it, friends. He is amazing. I listened to him this summer during my summer of Heal while I was in Connecticut, and I was so blown away. I was listening to him on uh, a new friend of mine's podcast, John Gordon. He does uh, Positive University. Um, we'll put a link to the episode that I listened to in this summary because it was such a good interview. And I just remember sitting in my backyard in Connecticut, just kind of like screaming, like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. Uh, his story and his way to out of kind of traditional medicine and into what he's doing now, which is really naturopathic, I guess I would say, because it's really about yeah. getting to the root of the issue. And, you know, he talks about how he started feeling like a pharmaceutical rep while he was in traditional medicine and that the toolbox he was dealing with was so thin and how frustrated he was, he wasn't getting positive results from his patients and, um, and so much more. And then also as he studied nutrition, how challenging it was because the system is so committed to the food pyramid and dairy and meat. And he was saying things like plant-based diets are reversing diabetes and helping with cancer and so many things. And so it's challenging to work within those parameters if, uh, if you have uh, another way. And so Anyhow, it's going to be a really, really incredible interview. I'm super excited. He's one of the only triple board certified physicians uh, out there. And um, I'm really, really excited. He's internationally recognized educator, thought leader on the microbiome as it relates to health, disease, and food systems. He specializes in internal medicine, endocrinology, and hospice care. His passion for education reaches across many disciplines, including topics like the role of soil and water ecosystems in human genomics. Isn't his gut um, supplement? It has soil in it, yes. right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, yeah, including topics, like I said, such as the role of soil and water ecosystems in human genomics, immunity and gut brain health. His education has highlighted the need for a radical departure from chemical farming and pharmacy and his ongoing efforts are providing a path for consumers, farmers, and mega industries to work together for a healthy future for people and the planet. I am so excited to chat with him. And I think uh, we should just take a quick break and get right to it. We'll be right back. Um, we have, oh my gosh, I, you might be trapped in here. I think we locked the door, right? So we can't let him ever leave. Never. <laughs> He's never leaving. <laughs> so I guess to start with, um, because I find your journey to, what would you call the medicine you practice now? Mm. <laughs> um, I guess broadly speaking, it's natural, natural health, natural medicine. Okay. Uh, the functional medicine world was... I think a stepping stone for the industry, but uh, fell short of actually connecting us to source. And so source medicine, nature medicine, something along those lines. Okay. So I'm on the right page. <laughs> um, what, explain to everybody what got you here, because I was, I was telling them your frustrations kind of feeling like a pharma rep and the limited toolbox. And even when you started studying nutrition, um, what you were finding with plant-based diets that don't, work in the food pyramid that everybody wants to stay so dedicated to, unfortunately. So I'd love for them to hear a little bit about that kind of bumping up against the wall as, uh, as you were in the medical profession in the traditional world. So they can kind of see what's in a sense flawed. That's what I'm here every single day to do is we're trying to get better in all areas of life, but, um, health and wellness focused because, I feel like I have to 
ring the alarms for people to realize that isn't always the answer or the only answer. We're so trained to just trust our problems in our health with just any doctor. We lay it at their feet. They have a doctor in front of their name, done, trust them. And it's not always that. And we have to be seeking other answers and we have to be the CEOs of our health. And so I'm trying constantly to kind of shed, you know, shine some light on the flaws of the system. And I think you do it very eloquently (laughs) um, because we they're wonderful, but they are limited. Yeah, I think it's a little bit of the you go if you go to Midas, you get a muffler kind of effect, you know, and so the the place of business that you're going to when you go to a medical clinic or you go to a hospital is a place that does disease management. And so if you go to a place whose business and education and toolbox is about disease management, you're going to get disease management. In a best case scenario, that disease management is done in a humanitarian fashion where you feel like a human still and you feel connected and you feel like you're communicating with another person on the other side of the table or at the bedside. And that's the best case scenario. But in the end, you're getting disease management. And that's where I found myself as 17 years in academic medicine and, you know, years and years of learnings and memorizing and, you know, becoming a master of a toolbox that was ultimately about, you know, changing the numbers on a page. You know, I could change the cell type numbers in somebody with leukemia, or I could change the number of breast cancer cells on a scan. I could change. But at no point was my toolbox helping me really understand the trajectory of life within that individual. The disease trajectory we study into oblivion and we know, Hmm. you know, because of billions of dollars of spending every year on on medical research, which is to say chronic disease research. I know so much about a cancer cell. I know so much about the vascular tree that would lead to cardiovascular disease. I know so much about the pancreas liver and its relationships that would cause diabetes. But I don't know as a medical doctor what makes life possible in the womb of a woman? What makes it possible for an energetic center that we might call a soul to animate life? And then once that life is born into this world, what would allow that organism, that biology to perform at its highest vibration, to express itself fully? What would it look like to take a life and define it as success of biologic or spiritual sense of progress or a sense of fulfillment. Those are things that don't even come into the equation for your physician or your nurse practitioner or whoever you're working with. And so it's important as you engage the, the medical industrial complex that you understand that this is a chronic disease machine under the umbrella of this chronic disease management system, the most expensive thing we've ever created as humans. It's five times more expensive than our entire military and defense budget and everything else is our quote unquote healthcare budget. The words health and care are very ironically placed over the the institution that is chronic disease management. And so we're spending now almost $4 trillion annually just in the United States on chronic disease management. And unfortunately, a huge chunk of that budget is in our children. Our kids have become so sick at such young ages. And so we're pouring resources in. And if you really want to become convinced of how much money is being channeled towards this, all you have to do is go to one of these magnet, you know, healthcare centers, Cedar sinai or, you know, Texas Children's Hospital down in Houston. These are like the gold standard of healthcare. And when you walk into these places, they are like the pantheons of old marbled hallways, columns, three stories high, waterfalls inside, plants growing. Like They're designed as we had built cathedrals back in the day. We're now building hospitals to demonstrate that kind of power, that kind of affluency, that kind of energy that is collected in a $4 trillion industry is being expressed in this architectural 
pantheon of the gold standard or the highest you know standards of healthcare. So what does that mean? It might make us feel good when we walk in to a place like, wow, this place must really know what they're talking about because they have marble halls and they have the echoing waterfall and they've got you know water features on every wing and and they've got music pumping through you know and, and they're creating a user experience that's fantastic and obviously i'm describing the 0.1 percent of hospitals because most hospitals you walk in you feel like you're a cog in a machine and there's no nature anywhere and it's a death <laughs> kind of feel to the whole experience mm-hmm. but when we look at these pantheons of of the chronic disease management industry, I think it's a big warning to us that, wow, we have poured what we used to put into spiritual reverence. We're putting towards our medical industrial complex. We're putting so much trust, so much value in what they deliver through chronic disease management that we allow them to have this much resources to build these facilities like this. And so there's a mismatch ultimately when you engage the industrial medical complex, there's a mismatch perhaps between what you think you're going to get and what actually is going to happen. And the more wide open you can be, eyes wide open into that, perhaps you continue to engage the medical system, but with a different lens of like, okay, I've got this, I just got a diagnosis. I need to do some damage control around this situation. Maybe I have high blood pressure. Maybe I have major depression and I'm suicidal. I need some temporizing measures. And I'm going to go ahead and engage with this medical complex. But at no point am I going to surrender my, uh, my health or my track towards this industry. I just got the chills. I'm going to move into this with the intention of utilizing this as a resource for my own journey. And if you go into it that way, you're going to have a completely different result. Don't surrender your power. You are a miracle. The fact that you came out of a womb is so far beyond anybody's scientific understanding of life at this point. We do not know. I guarantee you there's not a physician or scientist on the planet today that can tell you how a fetus forms correctly in the womb and then goes on to be animated by some sort of energetic center that you might call a soul that then expresses the capacity for the nuances of creativity, curiosity, love. Uh, Who the hell knows what the hell those are? How does this little biologic mix of 70 trillion human cells that are animated by 14 quadrillion bacteria that we call mitochondria, how does that become a vessel for the vitality of curiosity, for the, for the exponential capacity of creativity, for the vibrational experience of love, for the capacity to witness beauty? We just don't know. We don't know how that happens. And so don't surrender your miracle to a chronic disease industrial machine. Well, you put it a lot better than me. That is, uh, that is exactly what I'm trying to share with people. And so if you can explain to people a little deeper what those flaws are, right? I always say it's really great for diagnostics. And like you said, for emergency repair, but, um, but when you look at the limitations, um, that's why I think it's, it's so important to find naturopathic doctors and people who are constantly studying, constantly upgrading their toolbox and um, just know that, I mean, Hippocrates said, let food be thy medicine. I mean, there's some simple laws that we just don't follow anymore. I mean, you know, you become diabetic and they tell you to eat bread at every meal. (laughs) It's like, well, wait, why? When you can get your your carbs from vegetables, (laughs) right? And so you start to see how much you are supporting the industry of diabetes by following their diets. Right. And I don't think that there are bad doctors. I think it's just the system is flawed like that. 
Um, but you can, you can get your vegetables from your carbs from vegetables to sustain your blood sugar levels or, um, or there's so many ways naturally to help aid in your cancer journey that I know you, you even studied vitamin A and how important it is. I wish I had known about the vitamin A with my mom who had stage four brain cancer, but with my mom, I didn't surrender her care to anybody. It was I'm going to be the CEO and the quarterback. I'm going to use everyone's brilliant minds. And then I'm going to come internal. I'm going to meditate, pray, ask for the answers. And, and I guided like that. And we got five years. And the only reason she's not here is because she got COVID and got too weak to take the treatments that she had to take. Um, so she would have, she would have made it even longer, but. I would, I would pose in that scenario. Yeah. You know, my third subspecialty was in hospice and palliative care. And so I was a hospice medical. Director. Oh, what a nightmare that is. It's a, it's a joy to be a part of though. It was the brightest part of my whole oh. medical journey really. And the, experience that I had, you know, 80 patients a week admitted to our hospice service. And so when you're seeing that rate of this last moment, this last chapter unfolding in people's lives, what I came very convinced of is that there's absolutely no accidents in the departure timing. Every departure is so beautifully coordinated you know, it's the symphony of life comes to its final note at exactly the right moment in the piece of music. And the sovereignty that we have as beings, whether that be expressed as a biology or a spiritual soul or whatever your viewpoint, that last note is as, as coordinated and as, I think intentional as the moment of entry. A lot of people have gotten, you know, over thousands of years, very amazed by the power of, you know, astrology, for example, look at the stars and look at the patterns of the planets at the moment of your birth and be humbled that that somehow is predictive of your personality and your overexpression of this soul within a body. How is that possible? Science is getting to the point where we're starting to understand that, you know, the water within your body is a column of water that it acts as an antenna and it's changed just as the tides of the ocean by the position of the moon, the planets, the sun. And now we know epigenetics, the, the subtle nuances of your environment at the moment that you're conceived in the environment of your womb. We're starting to understand how something like astrology might be possible. But what I know in the death and dying process is that we have overlooked the power of the astrology of the moment of departure. We're so focused on the human birth mm. and we see the human death as an endpoint. I would like to spawn a whole new science of the moment of death, which is a rebirth process. And so it'd be interesting for you to look back at your mother's journey and look up the astrology of the moment that she departed mm. and picture that as the moment she picked to rebirth into the, the next journey, whatever that holds for her. And it's very compelling when you lay that out that on the human analytical side, it might feel like, well, it was COVID that p picked the end point or it was this or that, or in the end, she picked that end she point. Did. She did. And she coordinated life events around her to allow for the manifestation of that departure right when it happened. Well, she knew I wasn't going to give up. <clears throat> she she knows you well. <laughs> We've talked that about that. She knew I wasn't going to give up and she was tired. Yeah. And I think she knew. You know, what's interesting is um, in hospice care, what I learned that was really challenging is the second you get on hospice, they are so eager to drug the patient up and send them on their way. And I know that from what I've learned is they make more money that way too, right? Because they get a certain amount each month. If, you know, they get rid of you faster, they get to keep whatever they don't spend. So whether it was needing things, like I wanted to get blood work on her once and they said, no, she's dying. You don't need blood work. And I'm like, but I really would like the blood work because you're telling me her organs are all in failure and I don't agree. And let's just do the blood work. So they made me pay out of pocket. Fine. I didn't care. Guess whose blood work was like healthy, like a 35 year old's, my mom's said, so she's not an organ failure. They just want to keep drugging them up. 
And I was committed to her passing in her time, not in their time. And so it was a bit of a struggle. And, um, and I, of course, you know, had to make some tough decisions at different points. But my mom left on her time and in the most pristine condition. Things would be swelling, things would be failing, and they were like, oh, that's just what happens. I'm like, no, I'm going to fix anything I can fix. So whatever it was, I would use common sense and come up with solutions and fix the different issues so that she had a pain-free journey and it was not just going to be a morph situation, a morphine situation. My mom ended up leaving on Greek Easter, Mm -hmm. the holiest day of our year. Mm -hmm. And if I had not, you know, pushed them away, they would have taken her earlier. Or at the same time, I don't know if they can actually change her destiny on that way, but what would have happened likely, and I th- think I was responsible for this at times, is, and you know, my maturation as you know, a, a physician that was surrendering the toolbox at that time, early on in those four years with hospice, I was still steeped in that medical model and saw, saw the hospice journey as one of my major stimulus for changing my worldview and and my sense of role in that process of death and dying. But what I'm concerned about is not so much that we have the power to change the day of departure, because I think that's coordinated at some sort of spiritual level much greater than the, the medical complex is capable of really changing. But the condition at which we meet that is what you're getting at there that is so powerful. And that's actually my concern for all of humanity right now. Uh, We just moved into our hospice moment as a species. Over the last decade, we suddenly get caught sight of our own mortality as a species, and we can see our own extinction looming. And that's kind of remarkable that we have the scientific foresight to be able to predict our own disappearance. Uh, This is like getting that, you know, cancer study, you know, done that says, oh my gosh, you have a tumor, you've got three years to live. Uh, We have a malignancy growing within the human condition that will see us perish of this condition within the next few decades. At best case scenario, we kind of have that 80 to 100 years left. Uh, And that's based on not just looking at the explosion of chronic disease, which is certainly playing into this, but really our explosion of infertility. We have one in three males in Western countries now infertile by sperm count. That is a 57% decrease in sperm over just a 40-year period. And so if we do that, continue on that linear journey of declining sperm counts, which hasn't slowed yet, but if we continue on that, then we will be infertile, sterile as a human species within this next few decades. And so we've got such little time to shift gears, to change direction, to realign ourselves as a species with our natural course if we are to avert this hospice moment. And while that sounds doom and gloom, my overall experience with hospice is that it is the second birth. It is the most beautiful moment when an individual comes to this release where they're like, oh, my goal is not to live long anymore. My goal is to live real, completely present, moment to moment. And I see people live more life within those last few weeks of a biologic arc that we might call a lifetime. I see them more alive and live more life because they are more present than any of the previous decades. And one second of presence can create an eon of experience. It can tap you into this timeless space where you can suddenly feel every relationship you've ever had. You can see that the beauty of that crystalline structure of your life that has all these facets of the gem cut by the very human interactions that you might have moments ago thought were failed relationships or whatever it is. Those were the things that cut the surface of the gem of your life into this perfect crystal. And when you become present, you get to experience the beauty of who you are and why you're here. And every experience suddenly becomes a magnification or a megaphone for the beauty of creation that is playing out in your life. And so that precious moment of being present, if it takes a diagnosis of you're about to die to get you there, 
that's that's still the most precious moment of life. And by and large, you know, whether it was patients in my clinic or patients on my hospice service, I heard over and over and over again that this was the best gift in my life was this metastatic cancer or this autoimmune disease or my liver disease or whatever it was became their best gift because it was the thing that finally helped them cut all of the BS out of their life, cut away all of the expectations on self and simply be for a moment. And in that moment of being, there was such a release from the sense of failure, sense of inadequacies that had defined that egoic journey that they were on. And they suddenly solve for that. And so the dis-ease of the disease becomes the avenue right into this bliss state of being present, being love, being a source of light. So as a human species, we now sit at that moment of our hospice diagnosis. And if we wake up right now and become present, the crystalline structure of our species, the whole human arc, the journey of the 200,000 years as Homo sapiens sapiens crystallizes into something spectacular. And there will be a shift in awareness from an egoic, I'm not enough, I need to work harder, I need to extract more, a shift from a sense of scarcity and disconnect from nature, a shift into a state of connected abundance where we suddenly realized the journey was perfect. It was exactly what we needed. We needed the, we needed the hospice diagnosis to get us there. And in that moment we could become present. And so your mother's journey and your advocacy for her is a path forward for us in these next decades. If we release judgment on the outcome, maybe we go extinct, maybe we change everything and we don't go extinct. Those two options are both describing a rebirth. We have to rebirth this species. If we have to do it through, through death of the species, we'll do that. But if we change everything and stay to play in this next era, on a, a new epoch on Earth, we will birth a new humanity. We will birth something completely different. But to do either of those, we're going sh- to need to make sure we're not dripped out on morphine. And unfortunately, that's what's happening to society right now is we are being drugged into numbness to our own extinction. And that's what scares me more than anything else is we're just not feeling it. Mm. And if we feel it, we will have an avenue into the rebirth process, whether that be through our extinction or through our reinvention of our species. And so it is our mission right now to feel And if you can reach deep past, you know, all of the distractions of your day into a rooted experience of just acknowledging how you feel right now, you will become part of the solution. Feel the heartbreak that you feel right now. Feel the loneliness you feel by missing your mother or your family member that passed recently. Feel the heartbreak of your relationships. Feel the heartbreak of your sense of you know destruction of the planet that you see around you as humans continue to extract the point of you know this massive desertification this monoculture of life that we've we've created whether it be in our cornfields or in our shopping malls the monotony of what we've created is such a a hideous you know alternative to the beauty that nature has been creating on this planet for billions of years the biodiversity a sunset, a sunrise, like how did we build walls that would block our ability to see a sunset? How did we build schools that would keep our children from smelling earth in fresh rain? How did we imagine hospitals that would somehow, you know, put out a marketing campaign for health and serve the crap food that's in that place? And gown our our caretakers in latex and plastics and make sure that they don't breathe the air that our loved ones are dying breathing. How did we do that? How did that all happen? And it was out of a collective numbness and a desire to separate ourselves from feeling that created the quote unquote, you know, (laughs) It's so ironic, but the comfort that we've been pursuing in modern society, you know, 
get more comfortable housing, create air conditioning, create plastic off-gassing cars so we can drive around comfortably in L.A. heat. You know, like in our pursuit of comfort, we so eliminated the beauty of the world from our own experience. And for that, we became numb. And we're having a hell of a time feeling what it feels like to be alive. One of the great minds of, of the 20th century that I really just wish had a larger platform these days is Khalil Gibran. And he, he was a poet, really, you know, a philosopher. And somebody asked him about parenting and, you know, how, how do you parent? What's a good parent or parental philosophy? And I'll probably misquote it slightly, but he says something along the lines of about your children. They come through you, but they not, do not come from you. And about your children, you're allowed to try to think like them, but at no moment should you ever try to make them think like you. And I love that message about a child because ultimately that's what's happened in our quote unquote adulthood of humanity, in our belief that we were you know, able to micromanage the experience of being alive in our parenting of the human experience. We dumbed it down. We lost our childlike sense of magic, our childlike knowingness of the miracle from which we come, the miracle of which we are. And so in our eagerness to leave our childhood behind as a species and develop technological solutions to our environment and technological solutions to our own comfort and technological solutions to, so that we would work less and technological solutions that we would have an easier avenue towards wealth, however we would find that. We left behind the very essence of being alive. And so we, in our hospice moment, need to become childlike. We need to shift gears into that childlike mind that is in a constant state of wonder. And in our wonder, we may find ourselves back into curiosity of who are we actually? How are we related to the elephants on your wall here? Hmm. I just got to see Zebra for the first time in the wild and you know, growing up seeing them in zoos in Colorado and stuff like that was funny and interesting. But when you see zebras out in the wild, it's insane mm -hmm. that nature decided to do that. And how the heck does nature do those black and white stripes like that? And to what end? To what end is that? See, and the way that they stand over and over again for their own protection, they'll stand flank to flank with heads going the opposite directions. And when they start to move or you're moving past them, you can't tell what direction the animal is even heading. And so they can two or three at a time become one organism visually and confuse you know, their predators. And so nature does zebras. Who are you? What are your stripes that nature so carefully designed and that you've covered up? Why are you covering up your stripes? Mm. You are so specifically drawn by the nature within you and the sinews of your body are so perfect, so, so magnificent. The way that the muscles on the backs of your legs connect to your low back, to your buttocks, how your low back connects up into your broad muscles of your back and shoulders, how your muscles of your shoulders extend up your neck to, to suspend your head. And then that you have fluid motion in, the, in that context every curve every line every wrinkle on your face these are the these are the zebra stripes that you were given to express life and we spend so much time covering it up and we spend so much money covering it up and we develop whole areas of medicine functional medicine biohacking to try to hack our way out of aging when in fact, the whole thing is a extraordinary distraction from the state of being alive and being present. Mm -hmm. And so we need to let go of the data. We need to stop trying to hack life and start being alive. Wow. Being alive. Um, when you talk about the collective numbing 
Um, are you referring to the fact that we don't want to ever feel and we just medicate very quickly? We sure do. We sure do. And it's in ways that might be subtle or hidden from you. Um, you're medicating yourself today with your social media feed. You're medicating yourself with your routine with your coffee or your Starbucks matcha latte or whatever you're doing. And I'm, I'm just like you. I, I medicate myself all the time, um, trying to give me myself solace, trying to give myself a little bit of space from the discomfort of being me. It's pretty freaking uncomfortable to be completely present with my human condition. Because no matter how many things I surrender, no matter how many times I'm willing to be stripped down further, no matter how many identities and roles in the community and society I'm willing to let go of, there's still a fundamental disconnect between my trajectory as a biologic vessel of a human body and my soul. That is an infinite expression of life and beauty. And it's the discomfort between those two realities. It's the friction that's caused by the disconnects or the, the, the misdirections of one versus the other that creates this sensation of discomfort within me. And I am uncomfortable about love for myself. I'm uncomfortable doing what I want to do every day because I'm afraid somebody's going to judge me for doing exactly what I feel like doing every day. And so I create all of these expectations on myself and I shut myself down and I keep the lid on. If I really did what I wanted to do right now, I would be the most socially unacceptable person on the planet. It would be insane. There would be complete mayhem going on in this studio right now. <laughs> we love mayhem. <laughs> I would be living in the wild with the animals. Yeah. That's where I would be. Which would be mayhem. Yeah. Because wh how, who's going to extract any wealth out of you? Who's going to sell you every, anything if you're living in nature? Mm -hmm. you're, you would be such a problem to the current constructs of society if you went and did what you want to do. And yet we keep doing what we don't want to do. And so there's this inherent discomfort that is natural to an unmedicated state. And it's in finding out that it's by moving into your pain, by moving into your discomfort, that you're going to find your path forward mm -hmm. instead of resisting the discomfort and resisting the pain. And so I'm getting better at just sitting in the discomfort of being me. And uh, it's hilarious. Like it, at some point it's, it's kind of like pain itself. Like, Pain at some point creates laughter. You know, maybe maybe your biggest source of pain has been like, if you're lucky, deep body work or something like that. You, know, <laughs> you have that deep massage and suddenly you're laughing because it hurts so bad because that therapist has got their hands so deep in your psoas muscle in your belly. You can't breathe. You're just in so much pain. You think you're in blackout and that person's just relentlessly holding that space and you keep tolerating it and you keep in that space because you inherently believe that that person is there for your own therapeutic outcome. If we start to see pain as being that in our life, it is there to create the therapeutic outcome of your realignment with self, your realignment with the infinite nature of your soul with a finite expression of a body. Your finite body is connected to something infinite. And that infinite source is always on. It's always true. And it's, it does not carry any trauma. The soul is an energetic expression. That word soul has a lot of religious trappings to it. But when you get past the religious trappings and recognize it as an energy center that organizes intelligence of nature, you, you can start to see this under a microscope very easily. For example, the, a liver cell knows what it is, which is pretty remarkable that this little cell that's, you know, it's, it's a quarter of the width of a human hair. It is so tiny, you know, and yet there's a universe inside of that single cell that gives it a sense of identity and purpose so much so that it knows exactly not only how to be a liver cell, it knows how to be eternally a liver cell. Because as soon as it starts to die or become too injured by a chemical insult that may have happened to it in the last couple of days, it knows how to call in a pluripotent stem cell to come and replace it as a liver cell. 
And the stem cell, knowing how to make any other cell in the body, here's the call that I need to be a liver cell. And so it makes liver cell. That is so miraculous that self-identity is known at the cellular level. And so let me reassure all of you that you are an energetic intelligence that holds space for biology to express a self-identity. Your self-identity is so unique to you. And it is a fingerprint of an infinite energy that we might call your soul. And so when you invite in the opportunity to feel what it feels like to be alive as you, you're going to feel a lot of discomfort, perhaps initially, perhaps for a lot of years. And the discomfort hasn't diminished for me at all in some ways. But what has happened is that the discomfort is now conjoined with or woven with so much joy. And the experience of being alive now is this, this sense of childlike curiosity about what the day is going to bring. And there's so much joy interwoven, but the joy does not cancel discomfort. Joy and love does not cancel pain. And so we need to understand that life is about holding both of those and not letting go of either one and not trying to dull the experience of the pain with more love or more joy. And that's kind of how we've been trained. Oh, you got pain. You need more happiness. Mm -hmm. Go, go make yourself happy and this other stuff will go away. And so we keep scooping under the rug all of the negative feelings or the hard feelings that we have to deal with. And for that, we get disease. And disease always manifests in the pattern of our emotional past. And so we create long-standing traumas that then express themselves as cancers or autoimmune diseases or the rest by storing these, these vortices of, of pain or trauma, heartbreak within us without ever being so present with them that they feel heard and seen. An emotion just needs to be heard and seen and felt. That's its whole purpose is to be felt. If you're refusing to feel your own spiritual emotional journey, you, you're going to have to store that up and process it through some next chapter. I don't know, next life, who knows, but... The, and the, you're disconnected. You're disconnected from the very thing that's screaming to you. This is you. Why are you refusing to feel you? Why are you f refusing to be you? And again, it's because of these little subtle beliefs, I think, of how it should be. Yes. I don't want to be me because I'm afraid that would look really disruptive. And I, I feel like I wouldn't fit in. Yeah. And you're never supposed to be sad. The second you feel sad, someone says, like, oh, no, don't cry. That's the first thing someone says. Like, no, no, no. Um, that's what I say to people now. I'm like, no, no, no. Let me cry. I need to let it out. Don't stop it. Um, because I do believe that everything gets stored. So now knowing that these pent up feelings get stored in the body and manifest as illness. Wouldn't that be the path to healing illness? Mm -hmm. It really is an opening. That is the path. And you, you spoke to the limitations of the medical field. And I think, you know, our education is enough to, to lay that out for anybody. You know, in the first semester of medical school, you get taught one course called physiology and you get one course called nutrition. Hmm. And uh, in those you know, couple of three hour credits that you get for nutrition or three hour credits you get for physiology, that's the end of the journey of understanding uh, a proactive role towards health. And then the rest of the, the four years of medical school are all about understanding the context of humanity within its disease. And for all of the limitations of that, it's much more telling that there's not a single course called emotional detox or emotional realities or, you know, the impact of emotions on physiology. Not a single class. We've, we're not even, we have no training on what the role of disease would look like in the context of an emotionally unprocessed body. And in the same way, we're not given any tools to understand our own emotional journey as physicians or caretakers 
in this process. And so what a ludicrous system of we're going to train you for four years in disease and then we're going to put you on the front lines of the collapse of the human species. And we're going to ignore that you're going to have a whole lot of emotions on that experience. You're going to feel worthless. You're going to feel hopeless. You're going to feel ill-prepared. You're going to feel completely inadequate to change the course of disease and death because you are inadequate. And it only takes a few years of being a doctor before you realize you aren't changing anything. You Mm. aren't changing anybody's trajectory with the toolbox you've been given. You might change their blood sugar, but you haven't changed their lifespan. You might change this or that around, but you haven't really affected the way in which life expresses itself within that human being. So there's this deep pain as a provider that starts to develop. And so we have to reach for more and more extreme measures to dull ourselves to the very experience of being a practitioner, a doctor, a nurse, whatever it is in these environments, because we are not trained to even you know, conceive of, let alone deal with an emotional journey for ourselves, let alone the patients that we might interact with, let alone the humanity that we're trying to aid. And so physicians have one of the highest suicide rates in the world, second only perhaps to, to farmers. And it's telling that both farmers and physicians are trained with the same toolbox, toolbox of chemical management of biology. Our farmers are trained to go out and kill biology with the herbicides and pesticides that they are equipped with. And our, our doctors are trained to go out and kill bacteria and cancer cells with the drugs they're given. And so when you are equipped with a chemical arsenal for killing things, your state of, of vitality is going to be rapidly diminished. And your sense of drive for life is going to disappear very quickly and suicide is going to be your only way out. And so that is the dismal reality of our chemical complex today because it's not actually just a medical industrial complex. It is a chemical pharmaceutical medical complex that begins with the food we eat. And so the same chemical companies that develop the pharmacy that is pumped into your veins in a chemotherapy are the same chemical companies that that own the seeds and the genetically modified herbicide resistant uh, crops out there in the fields and so uh, ultimately it's the chemistry of technology it's the chemistry of killing nature that is driving a loss of sense of vitality within our farmers and physicians around the world and then the byproduct is ill patients The byproduct is an ill humanity, right? Uh, Humanity is failing so quickly now in our self-expression. And I think that's why we see the social landscape that we see today. We've never been more polarized. We've never sought out more violent conflict between one another. Uh, The pandemic really drove this home. We, We separated families. We separated mothers from children, we separated spouses, we separated grandparents from their families out of a narrative of fear of the other, uh, afraid of the COVID they might carry or afraid of the vaccines they might have had or had not had, fear of this or that. And we were ready for that narrative. We were ready for the biggest fear-mongering event in human history because we were so desperately hopeless inside. We needed something to justify the way we felt. Oh. And so we used a virus as a justification of the way we feel, which is highly hopeless, which is highly charged and polarized. And we need something external to ourselves to blame the way that we feel. And if we don't wake up quickly, we're going to keep blaming something else. I think we're going to start blaming alien attack or some other existential threat just to justify the way we feel inside. If we realize that the way we feel inside is because we are simply disconnected from our nature and from our real identity, then we don't need to keep blaming the world around us for the human journey. And we can start to come to terms with the fact that it is a human journey. And there is a pain point within each of us that is the entry point into a different future. Wow. I, um, I remember growing up, anytime somebody got sick, it was, oh, I know the best, you know, my buddy's got the best 
you know, cancer doctor. My buddy's got the best endocrinologist. And we were trained, we got to find the best, right? And then the best is just what Kelsey says is the best or Jimmy down the street says is the best. You're not doing your own research. It's just whoever is the best. And so I took it to the next level and I would research because I'm a journalist. So I study and I'll do my research. And then in the journey with my mom in those five years, I started to realize just how little sometimes these experts knew how a lot of them were throwing spaghetti at the wall, hoping something would stick. And when I realized that, that's how I became so much more empowered to realize the answers were within us and we had to make the changes. And after I was diagnosed with my brain tumor, um, people would reach out to me and I started kind of helping them behind the scenes because I had an accelerated like journey. Now I had the, the cheat sheet for kind of things they could do and, and, and things to focus on. And I always was saying, what's the emotional component here that you have not dealt with? And every time I said that, people were like, how do you know? And I'm like, well, I've kind of now been on the phone with over a hundred of you and you all have something you haven't dealt with. And it's just led me to believe that we all have some emotional component that's hiding underneath that's creating this illness, along with obviously everything's poisoned, our food supply, our water supply, our air supply, and all of that. And we're eating everything out of packages. Everything's processed. There's nothing real. So obviously we're doing ourselves a lot of harm with the sugar intake and everything. Everything's a, a mocha latte frappuccino, extra whipped cream and sugar on top and all of that. But you know, the, the emotional part, nobody really talks about unless you're in the woo woo world and the woo woo world is like healing people of cancer every day because they know that this is such a big part of it. Um, I feel like, uh, a lot of the messages that you're saying today, you know, not surrendering your miracle to somebody and waking up and feeling are so important because we're taught as a society that we're not supposed to feel bad and we're never supposed to have a bad day and we're never supposed to have these emotions. Like, let's just wrap that up. We're supposed to be living our best life. You know, mm. what, what's the thing the millennials say? Living my best life. Is that it? Um, I don't say that, so I can't take credit. No, yeah. It's yeah. living, living my best life. Living my best life. Or and living like, your best life, whatever. And yeah. I look at the pictures and I'm like, <laughs> no, you're not. I actually know the story behind the scenes and you're really not. But, it's all social media. Yeah. But, um, but Pro projecting what you think is your best life. Or wishing <laughs> that that was right. You're projecting what you're, you wish it was. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's when you're, when you're dealing with a cancer patient in your, your work, is that part of your protocol? It's like, you know, cause to me, it's like, you got to deal with the nutrition, you got to deal with the emotional. Like I had my list of things I would go through with people. I was a fake doctor. Um, I would tell people I'm not a real doctor. <laughs> I just have studied a lot of things and I'm going to give you some, some avenues to pursue, but I'm not a doctor, but I call myself a fake doctor, but it was, it was the nutrition. And then the emotional was like a big part of it. So what, what do you work on with people? Yeah. Yeah. It's really come to, uh, a really wonderfully small toolbox. And I, I would say that that's, that's what you want to look for in a healthcare team around you is a, a group of people that have so simplified their toolbox. You know, I went from studying, you know, a couple thousand drugs uh, to manage a couple thousand diseases to eight steps of a lifestyle that is the fundamental foundation to prevent all disease. And so that's, I think, been my journey is one of simplification, simplification, simplification. So over the 12 years since living, leaving academia and, you know, diving initially into nutrition, I started a nutrition center for reversing chronic disease called Revolution Health Center back in, in 2010. And I was in rural Virginia, which was intentional. I wanted to find like the biggest food desert in the world and figured if I could change the environment there, if I could help patients find health independence through nutrition in a food desert, then it could apply to the world. And when I people started hearing I was going to start a plant-based, you know, kind of vegan diet clinic in rural Virginia, they're like, you are insane. That is going to be so phenomenally unsuccessful. And of course, <laughs> they were completely right financially, but the human result was so beautiful and so rich. And what I learned on that journey is that 
you know, the toolbox that I had been given for the pharmaceutical world, I had, even in my effort to, to move towards a holistic clinic, I was doing, you know, I, somebody walked in who did acupuncture and she showed me what that could do. And somebody walked in a Barbara Brennan therapist that I'd never heard of energy therapy and Reiki and all these things. And then Ayurvedic nutrition came my way and all this stuff. And so it was like, suddenly we had this incredible gamut of resources. But even in the execution of that clinic, as we became more and more, you know, kind of holistically minded, it continued to be these external stimulus that we were doing to the individual. And so what Mm -hmm. we ended up doing was about seven years ago, flipped the model and said, what if... What if the individual was the toolbox? What if the in, inherent qualities of biology within this individual was their medicine? What would it look like to create an environment around that person that then allowed them to be their own medicine, to be their own health journey? So that program is now called Journey of Intrinsic Health, and it's an eight-week program, and it's become so successful. I've actually dialed my clinic down, and we're just doing this kind of global you know, project now where we're taking people from all over the world through this eight-week journey. Uh, you can do it as an individual with one-on-one coaching, or you can. we started at the beginning of the pandemic and everybody's isolation. We realized there was a huge need for connection, so we created the group experience where you're going through with six or eight people with a coach. And in that eight-week journey, whether you're doing that one-on-one with a coach or in this group setting, the, we've created a landscape of these eight tools of lifestyle that begin at your sense of self-awareness. And once you start to tune into your sense of self-awareness, then it changes the concepts of nutrition, hydration, fasting, exercise, breath work. It changes all these things that are taught all the time drastically because instead of it being an externalized tool to change your biology it becomes an internal expression or an expression of your internal capacity for that miracle of life that's within you and so the journey of intrinsic health is is become so important i think to my own personal journey as a physician and letting go of my clinic identity was really emotional uh, and it was really intense for me i was like you know i spent you know, 25 years of my life identifying myself as a care provider in a clinic or hospital setting to let go of that was was super intense and i thought oh my gosh i'm gonna let down all these patients that have been with me for 10 years and a lot of them have done you know miraculous journeys like can imagine being in a clinic where you reversed your cancer or reversed your autoimmune disease or came out of lifelong depression and changed your life like i had this this egoic mindset of like oh my god i've provided all of that for those people they're going to be so devastated when i close this clinic opportunity for them and of course it was absolutely the obvious they were like well we are so excited for you, Zach. You go do what you need to do. Obviously, it's bigger than this clinic. We don't need you anymore. We already figured out how to do our thing and everything you else. Them. And I realized, oh my God, the only codependent you know, of person in that whole clinic by the end <laughs> was me. And I was codependent in my sense of value as a person because I was a physician provider in a clinic. And that is just such a, a, a artificial value system for myself. I am an infinite soul that can't be, you know, limited in its expression or valued by a certification that sits on a wall or a white coat and a stethoscope that makes you feel, you know, trustworthy. I am, therefore I'm valuable. Like that, that is such a difficult journey to go on because Mm -hmm. you and I and all of us are holding on to these externalized identities that we don't realize are, are, manifesting our own value system for our own self-worth and so the journey of intrinsic health like every other step in my clinic pathway and in my whole medical career as a whole i find out that the path is really designed first and foremost for me as the first patient through the journey i am learning through the journey of intrinsic health to let go of my externalized identities and to become more and more me and the information within that course has gotten richer and richer in its impact over the last seven years, even though the content hasn't changed dramatically in its, in its, you know, analytical kind of scientific education, the way in which it's delivered has become more and more free, 
more and more energetically aligned with the individual going through the journey rather than me be, being the, the provider of the information. And so we've got this interactive community now, and we're very excited about the journey. This year we launched an app that allows the whole community to stay in touch with each other and become, become their own you know, kind of natives for change. And so the eight week journey is now turning into these infinite journeys where people are creating user groups and cities together and they, they're connecting to other people who haven't been through the journey. And, and so there's just this rich content being developed outside of myself, outside of my own scientific journey that is so much healthier, so much more stimulating for, for a future that we all know is possible because it's not limited to a physician, care provider, science, you know, consumer relationship. It's about being alive. And as soon as you start to feel what it feels like to be alive, the first thing you want to do is go create something because you're that child within you is so curious and can see so many possibilities. Mm -hmm. And there's no such thing as barriers. There's only new opportunities, you know? And so that's that childlike mind once accessed becomes an incredible avenue to discovery and uh, a new sense of vitality within yourself. But I guarantee you for all that joy you're going to find in your own journey of intrinsic health, however you go about doing that, it's not going to cover up the pain. It's not going to cover up the discomfort. And that is not a sign of failure. That is, does not mean you're not having enough joy. It means that the joy is actually highlighting, illuminating the areas of discomfort in your life so that you can bring yourself into further alignment and more coherence into who you actually are and what you want to be. Uh, so I'm very excited for all of us really in this hospice moment uh, to start moving into the pain and make sure we're not dulling the pain and make sure we're feeling what it feels like to be uncomfortable as a species that's inherently disconnected from its nature, disconnected from its self-identity. And uh, there's huge, huge opportunity for us to fall deeply in love with ourselves again. I love that. Be nice people, make good choices and be present. This podcast and all related content published or distributed by or on behalf of Maria Menunos or MariaMenunos.com is for informational purposes only and may include information that is general in nature and that is not specific to you. Any information or opinions expressed or contained herein are not intended to serve as or replace medical advice, nor to diagnose, prescribe, or treat any disease, condition, illness, or injury, and you should consult the healthcare professional of your choice regarding all matters concerning your health, including before beginning any exercise, weight loss, or healthcare program. If you have or suspect you may have a healthcare emergency, please contact a qualified healthcare professional for treatment. Any information or opinions provided by a guest expert or host featured within website or on company's podcast are their own, not those of Maria Menounos or the company. Accordingly, Maria Menounos and the company cannot be responsible for any results or consequences or actions you may take based on information or opinions.